Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed for another episode of Unboxing Boxes. I've taken a break from testing Threadripper. It's been a long couple of days now on the on the grind testing that, but I thought it'd be nice to take a break and have a look at some of the boxes that have been piling up at my front door and see what's inside. I am expecting an X399 motherboard from Azeroc in this pile. I also have boards from MSI and Gigabyte coming, but they're probably not arriving till tomorrow. So hopefully we get to have a look at one new X399 board and a couple of other cool things. Uh, so I'll start with this little box here because I think I know what this is and I'll get this out of the way. Yes, this is what I thought it was. It is a Core i7-7800X, and I actually purchased this myself with my own money. So this is a retail chip, not a QS sample, because so far I've got a couple of these, or all my Core X uh, CPUs are QS samples from Intel. And I thought, well, I would like to test a retail chip instead. So I went and purchased this. It was 560 Australian dollars. Now they are, Quite pricey at the moment, uh, selling for over the MSRP, about 450 US you can expect to pay for one of these six core processors. But yeah, this is the i7-700X, so it is the six core 12 thread model. And the reason I bought this was because some of you guys know I did do a 30 game comparison with this and the Ryzen 5 1600, all up to date, all latest numbers. Uh, and yeah, a few people were shocked, upset by the results. And I have to admit, I was very surprised by the results. I didn't expect Ryzen to be as competitive as it was with this chip. Uh, and yeah, there's been a few theories as to why that was. Some of them are true, some of them are just angry fanboys. Uh, but one was that the QS samples aren't as good as the retail chips that some people have started testing with. So I really don't think that's the case, but I can't rule it out either till I try one. So I thought, well, I'm gonna have to spend 500 and something dollars, get one of these and see if the retail chips are any better. So I will be testing that next week uh, to see if diff the numbers differ in any way from the QS sample that Intel sent out. I have spoke to Intel about this. Uh, I asked them if they could get me a retail chip and they refused to. So I've just gone and bought one and they say that the QS samples perform exactly like the retail chips. So I would probably agree with that. I'd say they're right, but you know, can't take them at their word. So bought it and we'll test it out. Um, on, on that note with that video, uh, some people pointed out, which was true, I was using higher latency memory on the Intel platform opposed to Ryzen. So I was using CL14 with Ryzen and CL16 with Intel, and that does hurt Intel's performance a little bit. We're only talking a couple of frames here. I've already done a bit of retesting with CL14 on the, uh, with the uh, X78 chip, and it was like, it was always at least one to two frames improved. Uh, so that will give it a percent or so over the Ryzen 5. I think at most I saw maybe four frames, but we're talking above well over 60 FPS here. So the margins aren't huge. So yeah, it does, does improve performance with the tighter timings, but uh, yeah, nothing significantly. It wasn't heavily handicapped in the original benchmarks. And finally, I just, I find it all a bit a little bit silly, like I want to make sure that I'm giving you guys accurate information, so I do take the benchmarking very seriously, which is why I've spent uh, quite a bit of money on the ASUS motherboard and now the processor. I've spent over a thousand dollars to ensure that my numbers are accurate by changing the motherboard and the CPU. Um, and yeah, we'll be looking into that further, but at the same time, they're not gonna be significantly down. Like the ASRock board's not gonna be that much worse. And people like Tom's Hardware have already tested the ASRock, ASUS and MSI boards and found them all to be much of a muchness in games. There's a little variance here and there, but overall much of a muchness. And you're not gonna see all of a sudden this is 40% faster and it's smoking the R5 1600. That's just absolute fantasy land stuff for Intel fanboys. It's not gonna happen. And with this chip priced almost 100% more, and that doesn't even factor in the uh, platform costs, which are significantly expensive uh, compared to something like a B350 board. It, uh, there's no way you can justify buying this if you want to do a bit of productivity stuff, a bit of encoding, rendering, what have you, and a bit of gaming. The R5 1600 is hands down the better value proposition there. And I review everything based on its value. But anyway, I'll move on from that because I'll just keep ranting and ranting and we want to do a bit of unboxing. I won't bother taking the chip out. You guys have seen those before. You know all about them. So let's move on. Uh, next up, I think we should probably try and find that X399 motherboard. It's definitely not going to be either of those. Uh, yes, it is this one. I'll just rip the shipping label off. Yes, that's what we have in here, is a new... 
Come on. Okay. So as Rock have said, this isn't the full retail package, which is quite obvious by looking at the black box. So there are some things missing like the IO shield and stuff like that. And that's quite normal when you get an early sample. And when I do build videos and I don't install the IO shield, tons of guys in the comments freak out about it. And I forget to put a text overlay saying I don't have the IO shield. Anyway, if I do a build video, ah, there is the IO shield in this one. So that was all a bit redundant. But anyway, sometimes, Sometimes you don't get the full retail package, but it looks like I've got all the, the bits this time. Here we go. Something really interesting about all the X399 boards I've seen so far opposed to the X299 boards, the Intel versions, uh, is that the VRM heat sinks are massive on the X399 boards. Like they've done a really good job of that. Plenty of power input and stuff like that. Uh, so that again suggests that the X299 stuff was heavily rushed. So on this board, it looks like we have an 11 phase uh, VRM. Again, massive heat sinks over it. So it looks like a really nice setup on this board. Should allow us to get some decent overclocks out of our Threadripper. Okay, I've just popped it out of the foam, taken the cable ties off. So there we go. Looking on the back of the board, it's quite interesting. There are a lot of capacitors on the back of this board, a lot more than you usually see. Um, and then yeah, on the front side, like I said, that 11 phase VRM, we also have a heap of SATA ports, significantly more, oh, well, I wouldn't say significantly more, more than we saw on the ASUS board a few days ago. So eight in total, we've still got the U.2. And on board, it looks like we have three uh, Ultra M.2 ports. So heaps of expansion there for your uh, storage and then we have uh, four PCI Express x 16 slots and it looks like the primary and I suppose it would be the secondary it's the technically the third slot are uh, they're both so those two there are both wired for 16 times so the full PCIe 3.0 bandwidth and then those two are wired for eight times so only half the length of the slot has pins so yeah, so you've got two 16s and two 8s. Uh, that's how they're hardwired. I've just done a quick count and it looks like you have a dozen, uh, or you can have up to a dozen USB 3 ports uh, with what's on the IO panel and the onboard headers. So that is a heap of USB 3 action. You obviously have uh, 802.11 AC Wi-Fi and it looks like a pair of Intel gigabit uh, ethernet controllers or yeah, gigabit ethernet ports. And it's kind of cool on that note, they've put Ryzen Threadripper on this plastic sort of IO cover rather than the usual Intel uh, ethernet stuff. Usually on here, all the uh, AM4 motherboards from ASRock, you have a big Intel logo here. And yeah, that sort of annoyed a few people having that there. So they've changed that to Ryzen Threadripper now, which is looks really cool. And yeah, it's a bit better than having a big Intel logo. Intel was probably paying them to do that. Um, so I'm not sure how the deals changed or whatever, but anyway, it now says Ryzen Threadripper, which looks really cool. I know you guys probably don't care about sound too much, but it is an important aspect of the motherboard. And we do have Purity Sound 4 on this board, and that's using the Realtek ALC uh, 1220 audio codec. And that's quite good. You've got some audio caps for that, and it's on an isolated section of the PCB. So that should be a decent audio solution there. And then, yeah, getting back to the uh, power delivery, we have an 8 pin power input here with a 4 pin. So it's good to see that we do have. Uh, or it would have been nice to have two eight pins, but uh, eight and four should get the job done. But yeah, that's a very quick look at the board. I'll probably do some kind of build with this board because uh, yeah, it is a really, really cool looking X399 board. And like the ASUS board I looked at a few days ago, it's very weighty. Uh, these X399 boards are very heavy indeed. Uh, decent slab of aluminium on there for the heatsink, but yeah, just a serious amount of components. Big heavy socket, that's probably a lot of weight just in that TR4 socket. But yeah, so there you go. Hopefully you guys have seen some cool B-roll of it that I've been throwing up. But yeah, impressive looking board there from Azrock. All right, next up, let's uh, take a look at this one. As some of you will have spotted, it looks very much keyboard shaped, suspiciously like a keyboard, this one. Okay, well that's what we're faced with. What? Okay, here we go, there's a label here. Okay, this is the Moto Speed CK888, 
Okay, that doesn't tell me much. Let's have a look inside. Ah, okay, so it's a mechanical keyboard and mouse combo. Right, so I just went and checked, and this was sent to me by Banggood, uh, online retailer, I believe, in China. Could have that wrong. Uh, but yeah, they've sent this over. This is a an affordable mouse and keyboard combo that they sell. And you, ooh, that, that, that's very smooth, that mouse. Uh, and you're probably wondering how affordable. Well, for a mouse and keyboard combo, especially a mechanical keyboard, uh, with what seems like a good quality mouse, it's very affordable, $57 US. That works out to be about $74 Australian. So for a mechanical keyboard with a mouse, that is extremely affordable. We've seen a couple of $50, $40 mechanical keyboards, but they haven't included a mouse. So we've got some nice big wide feet there with rubber pads. That sits on the desk with a lot of grip. The mouse is uh, extremely smooth the way that glides. It feels great. And uh, those clickers feel very solid and they give a nice tactile feed back. Uh, looks like we've got four buttons. So the mouse wheel, it's quite a nice wide grippy mouse wheel that is uh, clickable. Looks like we've got a DPI shift button here or adjust button. And then two uh, right click or uh, buttons on this right side of the mouse that you can access with your thumb like a so. But it looks like uh, we have an optical sensor for this mouse, not quite sure on the specification there, but you can shift between 800 DPI, 1000 DPI, 1600 DPI and 2400 DPI. Uh, yeah, so that's pretty cool. It is an RGB mouse as well, so you can see there's a couple of translucent strips pretty much all around the whole mouse, so it should light up quite a bit. I'll, um, you've probably seen some B-roll that already. Uh, and then the keyboard itself, so the font looks pretty much, it's that kind of ugly-ish font that every single cheap keyboard has. Uh, so it'll be very similar to the ones we've seen already, but they look, it's obviously cherry uh, blue knockoff switches, so they're not genuine cherry blues. Uh, but they do sound, they do sound quite good. I'd say there's a slight bit of variance in how the keys sound, but they all feel feel very good. I mean, for the money, mechanical keyboard, I'd say this is about as good as it gets. But yeah, I'll plug that in and give it a go. It is RGB backlit as well. I'm not quite sure on the controls and stuff, but I'll put some B-roll up of the effects and stuff when I try that out after the unboxing. Uh, it's a 104 key design. Uh, there are two... Uh, millisecond response actuation on the keys. Uh, what else? Uh, I would say if this is anything like all the cheap affordable mechanical keyboards I've seen so far come out of China, uh, there won't be any software or anything like that. It'll just be a function key and then a combination of buttons to change lighting modes and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd say that's the case. Anyway, a cool looking keyboard, very affordable. I'll give my uh, thoughts on how it works in the description or in, in the comments down below. All right, let's get this uh, big heavy box out of the way. I thought this might have actually been the X399 motherboard, but it wasn't. So we'll see, or at least we don't know what this is yet, but it wasn't that board because that board was in another box. This could be another X399 motherboard. <laughs> It isn't. It definitely isn't. It's a heap of UPS bags. Like, just, just a whole heap of them. That's all it is. is it's just UPS. Oh no, hang on. There is something else in here. It's not just UPS bags. This is probably why it was so heavy. There is a Seasonic Focus Plus Gold Power Supply. And it looks like it is the 650FX version. I believe that's 650 watt. Uh, and it is fully modular based on what is on the box. Let's take a look and check her out. So we've got a couple of temporary sort of Velcro-y cable ties. We have some zip ties and a couple of black screws. And we also have what looks like a Seasonic sticker. All right, power supply itself comes in your typical nice little bag. Take that off and Smell that new power supply smell. It's a little toxic. It's actually a pretty cool looking power supply. It's extremely uh, short for a 650 watt. Looks like that'd have to be a 14 centimeter 
uh, model that one. Probably says somewhere, I'll check that in a minute. But yeah, very compact. It looks like we've got a nice uh, 120mm fan on the top there. A cool little uh, logo in the centre. Come on. This is when you need nails. Did it. There we go. Ooh, it's nice and shiny. It has a cool little sort of painted design on here. Looks pretty impressive from all angles. We've got another bit of uh, plastic to peel here. That'll be what you'll see from the back of your computer case where you plug the power in. So that's a cool little uh, sort of certified sticker there. Speaking of certified, this is a gold certified 650 watt power supply. And I believe there's a 550 watt, a 750 watt, and perhaps even an 850 watt model. And yeah, as the box said, it is 100% modular. And we'll have a look at the cables in a second. So yeah, some of the highlights, it is 14 centimeters deep, uh, or 140 millimeters. So very compact for 650 watt unit, especially of these uh, specifications. Like I said, it is gold certified, 650 watt output for this particular model, uh, fully modular, it has a fluid ball bearing fan. Uh, it also has a hybrid sort of sleep mode silent control thing where until it reaches a certain temperature, the fan doesn't turn on. And probably the highlight for this Seasonic unit is the fact that it comes with a 10 year warranty. So that's pretty exceptional, especially given that it's not it's not outrageously priced. It's 105 US and that it actually isn't selling in Australia at the moment, so I don't know what uh, the Australian price would be or if it's even coming to Australia. But yeah, 105 US dollars for this particular model and yeah, with a 10 year warranty, that's pretty exceptional. The cables are in a, another cool little bag, pretty typical. Uh, so we've got a power cord here. This is, looks like a US power cord, so that's no good to me. Uh, and we have two different styles of sleeved slash rubberized cables here. Where's my knife gone? I need my knife. Ah, you can stop looking, I found it. That must, that must sound great. Uh, okay, so the more serious cables, like your 24 pin ATX power cable, your PCIe uh, cables for your graphics cards, and then the eight pin PSU cable, so there's no it's only a 650, 650 watt version, so you won't get uh, an 8 pin plus another 8 pin or a 4 pin. You'd have to go higher wattage for that. But yeah, 8 pin plus your 24 pin, and then you have a pair of PCI Express uh, connectors for your graphics card. And it looks like you can, you've got, uh, they're all 6 slash 8 pins, so they can do either 6 or 8. And each cable has two connectors, so you could run SLI or Crossfire cards off this power supply, assuming they didn't draw more than what it can deliver. Now, the uh, peripheral, uh, sort of your SATA and your four pin Molex cables, you have one four pin Molex cable and that has uh, three connectors on it. You also have the old floppy drive adapter because uh, fan controllers and things like that still use those. And then it looks like you've got, each cable has four, are they both the same? Yes, four SATA or SATA powered type, the seven pin uh, power connectors off those. So that's quite a bit of uh, power there. And they obviously plug in here and it's all pretty standard power supply-ish kind of stuff. But yeah, really good quality power supply there. Amazing warranty. Uh, yeah, I like that a lot. Seems like the price is very reasonable as well. I'd like to see what the 750 and if there's an 850 watt version as well, what they retail for. But uh, yeah, as usual, I'll throw the links in the video description so you can check it out for yourself. Uh, but that is a highly rated power supply. I know for a fact that things like the voltage regulation is excellent. The AC ripple and noise suppression, it's also excellent. Uh, and yeah, as you can see by the 80 plus gold certified. It is a very good power supply in terms of efficiency as well. So yeah, overall, really good value buy there. All right, last but not least, we have a package wrapped in a black garbage bag. So let's open that up and see what it's all about. So as you can see, this is a Radeon RX 560 from Gigabyte. And if you recall, I actually unboxed this very product not that long ago on the channel. Well, when I say this very product, it was a Gigabyte RX 560 gaming OC model, except it wasn't the two Gigabyte model, which I recommend you guys buy. Uh, it was the four Gigabyte model. 
Uh, the reason I recommended the 2GB model was because, typically speaking, the RX 560 doesn't really require 4GB. Uh, but, yeah, that's, that's what I've sort of, I'm going off past experiences there. I haven't done any updated testing with new games at 1080p using realistic settings to see if you can actually take advantage of that if the higher textures and things like that in games do make a difference. It's not going to impact performance, so they will perform exactly the same, um, but you may be able to use higher textures and things with the 4 gigabyte version, which may improve, well, should improve image quality. I don't know if that's true or not, but I wanted to get my hands on the 2 gigabyte version to compare with the 4 gigabyte version. I'm not just going to do the usual uh, performance comparison using sort of medium quality settings. I want to establish sort of a baseline and then see if you can crank things like textures up on the 4 gigabyte card without impacting performance and what it does to the visual quality. So there'll be screenshots and game footage and stuff like that. So that should be an interesting comparison and we'll sort of hopefully be able to settle on the two gigabyte versus four gigabyte thing for lower end cards once and for all. So anyway, that'll be an interesting video. That's gonna take a heap of time and that'll be a few weeks down the road from now. But yeah, keen to, keen to give that a go. Um, you guys have seen this card, so I won't bother taking it out of the box. I might throw up some B-roll of it out of the box a bit later on, so you will have seen that already. But yeah, that is an important graphics card for that uh, testing that I wanna do. So, that pretty much concludes this episode. We got to look at a very cool X399 uh, motherboard from Azeroth, which I'll be plugging in probably tonight and testing that one out and see how that goes. Uh, very cool power supply here, which I will be featuring in a build. Um, I already know it to be a good unit, but I would like to test it out for myself and see how it does, but I'm sure it'll work well. And then the budget keyboard and mouse combo from the uh, Banggood retailer. So I'll throw a link to that in the video description so you can go over to their website and check that out. But yeah, uh, really affordable and it should work very well for the money. And then I've got my processor, so I've got a lot of testing to do. But yeah, I'll be doing a heap of testing with that to see if there's any difference between the QS samples and the retail chips. And yeah, that pretty much concludes this rushed episode while I took a quick, a brief pause from the Threadripper benchmarking, which I'm about to jump straight back into. Uh, and yeah, you'll see that video on Thursday night. It'll be quite late, 11 p.m. my time here in Victoria, Australia. So yeah, Thursday night. All the Threadripper stuff will be done. The video is going to be quite lengthy. There's a, I've done a heap of testing, mainly focused on productivity stuff. There's a little bit of gaming in there, but yeah, mostly productivity and a few other things. But yeah, very interesting overall. Can't wait to show you guys that. So that's going to do it for me on this one. I hope you guys enjoyed this quick rushed random unboxing. I'm your host, Steve. I'll see you again soon.